Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Pop Culture Quorum Deo podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff, and I'm here with the other host, Jared Moore. Jared, how are you, man? I'm doing well, man. I've had a good day. Um, just had a had a good day at work, man. Things are things are going well. Things are looking up. Hey, I had a good day too. And you know why, Jared? Why? We have a bright, shiny new blog on Patheos. You want to tell our, mm-hmm. our listeners about this thing? Yeah, patheos.com forward slash blogs forward slash pop culture quorum deo and um, you'll find uh, several companion pieces to our shows on there jeff has written a couple i've written a couple and we're planning on writing many many more and so check us out on there and there's actually a little uh, you can sign up for email and get those as soon as we as soon as a new article drops it'll show up direct from our blog in your inbox yeah it's a pretty neat little feature I really like the artwork that Patheo has put together for us. Uh, one of the mm-hmm. things I'm planning to do with that blog is to put content that maybe wouldn't wouldn't be enough for a complete episode, or maybe we don't want to spend a complete episode analyzing a film, but I still have something I want to say on a particular piece of film or music or book that came out. I plan to do several of those with some of the Oscar bait movies that are coming out for Oscar consideration this year. So anyway, if that stuff sounds interesting to you, I I obviously love audio content. Got a podcast here. I like to read stuff too. And so sometimes that's a more digestible format if I only want to hear a quick little snippet. So anyway, if that sounds interesting to you and you want to hear more from me and hear more from Jared, check it out over there because there'll be content that's not covered on the podcast. And share with your your friends, family, enemies, everyone. Yeah, we're very thankful for the way that you guys have been doing that already. We're Absolutely. thankful for the the reviews we've been getting, the kind feedback. Uh, we're you know we're seeing download numbers go up and up, and all that's just thrilling for us. We're super excited. So please continue doing it because it helps new people find the show. But also thank you so very much for what you've done so far. Absolutely. And Jeff, tell them about Reddit. Tell them about how they can go on Reddit and make requests. And yeah, we really do want to be available to the people who listen to our podcast. We hope this is a conversation starter. Uh, I mean, obviously, in each one of these episodes, you're listening to us talk quite a bit, but we're hoping that that's not where the talking ends. We're hoping you're able to carry it on around your dining room table, over the cup of coffee with a friend, you know, maybe after Sunday school at church. And if you want to engage with us more directly, we're we're ready and available to do that. So reddit.com is a place that's sort of like a, a forest of message boards. And we have our own subreddit. It is found at reddit.com forward slash r forward slash pccd pod. You go in there and you can see we've been posting a lot of content in there. There's not a lot of comments right now because it's largely undiscovered, but uh, that's it's there so that we can talk to you guys. And so if you say, man, I really would love to hear you guys talk about this movie, put it in there. Odds are mm-hmm. we'll take that and, uh, and at least do oh, something absolutely. in an episode on it. You want to say, hey, you guys are idiots or... I thought this point was strong. What did you mean when you said any of that stuff, man? We're chomping at the bit to engage with you on that. So Jared and I check that uh, pretty regularly and we will, you know, we'll be quick to respond. So again, it's reddit.com forward slash R forward slash PC CD pod. And if you go to our Patheos blog, there's a link to it in the first post we put up there. Or if you go to pccdpod.com, which is the site we release our episodes through on the RSS feed, there's links to it there as well. So yeah, come talk to us. We'd love to we'd love to engage with you more directly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So this week we're talking about one of the most loved movies of 2017, and it really harkens back to one of the surprise hits of the 2010s. Yeah, we're talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and of course that's the sequel to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, which again, that was a movie that was released at a time of year when movie studios drop movies that they don't think are going to go very well. It was before Chris Pratt turned into a global box office phenomenon. Uh, It was a movie built around very obscure Marvel comic book characters, Mm -hmm. but it really set the world on fire. And the sequel was at least as well received. And so we're going to dive into the world of Star-Lord and Rocket Raccoon and Drax and Ego and uh, Gamora and Nebula and all the people, Yondu, that you've come to love from the Guardians of the Galaxy world. So, all right, guys, so we want to give a quick synopsis of this film. If you hadn't seen it, so you can decide if you want to listen on or if you want to hit pause here and go watch it and catch back up with us. I think it's still on Netflix. If you want to watch this and you have Netflix, I think you can do you can do that. You can catch it there for no additional cost. So Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is the story of Peter Quill, also known as Star-Lord, and his fellow Guardians 
of the galaxy who are hired by a powerful alien race known as the Sovereign to protect their precious batteries from invaders. When it is discovered that Rocket Raccoon, one of the Guardians of the Galaxy, has stolen the items that the Guardians were sent to guard, the Sovereign dispatched their armada to search for vengeance. As the Guardians try to escape, the mystery of Peter's parentage is revealed. That comes from Fandango. It's kind of the best synopsis I could find online. That's what's going on in this movie. That's also the point where we're going to tell you from here on out, beware. Spoilers are abounding. So if you want to hear our review and and have the movie spoiled for you, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, feel free to press on. If you want to watch the movie first, hit pause right here. Go watch the movie. Pick back up with play uh, when you get done. Jared, you ready to start talking about the movie? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's uh, run with the conscience report. Okay, man. Go for it. Um, There's uh, several sexual references in this movie, sexual innuendo. There's some scantily clad uh, men and women. Uh, as far as I know, there uh, there is no nudity in this movie, and there is some language as well. Yeah, the violence in this movie is dialed up to 11. But one thing that's interesting about this is that Marvel knows they're playing to a very young audience. You know, this the, the humor here doesn't always play to children, but they know children are going to be watching this thing and that parents, you know, are, are trying to find reasons to take their kids to watch this movie with them. And so you'll see a lot of people die and a lot of creatures die, but it's, it's very sanitized. So there's a scene in the movie where the character Yondu has a magic arrow that he controls with basically his mind and whistling. And he kills a whole ship full of people, but not a drop of blood is spilled. It's almost like a lightsaber in some ways. It must cauterize the wound as it slices through them. Uh, There's a big beastly creature that that dies very early on. And there's some gore there, but it it looks like Nickelodeon slime. It doesn't look like blood and, you know, gore. So there's violence, but it's kind of a cartoon violence. Uh, Can I ask you a question before we get into the actual plot? Did you ever sure. read the? Have you ever read any Guardians of the Galax- Galaxy uh, I, comic books? I have not. I have not. I didn't even know it was the real thing until the first movie came out, and I only went and watched it because everybody, you know, I watched it late. I don't know. I thought, how in the world can they make this good? When I saw the previews, I'm an I'm an old school comic book head, and I still like to read comic books. I try to stay if not reading regularly the issues that are coming out, at least up on the major story arcs. And I used to read Guardians of the Galaxy way back in the day. So back then, the the team was full of characters that nobody knows about now. Uh, There was Starhawk and Alita and Vance Astro, uh, who used to be one of the new mutants back before he was cryogenically frozen uh, and sent into the future on a space trek. I used to love those books. And so I had dropped out of reading them. I think the one I was reading had ceased publication a long time ago, like back in the 90s. And so I just thought they had been done with the property. And I I knew that they were bringing it back, but I didn't realize it had caught on with enough traction that it would become a film franchise. And really, there's only a few characters that are involved in this that I'd ever read before. I knew Drax, who in the comic books that I was reading was a much more serious character. I knew Ronan the Accuser, who was about as serious as he was portrayed in the original Guardians of the Galaxy film. I knew Gamora. uh, I knew Rocket Raccoon. But other than that, these were characters that I wasn't super familiar with because I don't really care for space comics beyond that original Guardians of the Galaxy run. And I just say all that to indicate this movie, I think for a lot of us, even people who are trying to stay tapped into the comic community came out of nowhere and grabbed our minds and our hearts and our attention. One of the ways it did that was through an incredible soundtrack, uh, which I think is an underrated way to, uh, to, to get people hooked on your movie. And kudos to Marvel for realizing that classic rock and roll has a lot of appeal to people still. And um, kind of you see that coming into this new movie, if I can transition into actually talking about the film, because it starts with that classic Brandy, you're a fine girl as an age, you know, a de-aged, a digitally de-aged Kurt Russell drives her around. So they're playing with really powerful stuff here in terms of hooking audience interest. Uh, with that in mind, you want to get into analyzing the story? Yeah, let's jump in, man. Okay, so remember, guys, we talked about this some more last week. We're we're wanting to know that we have the story down pat here, and so we're going to start asking questions of how this movie corresponds to the categories of God's story. So God in history is telling a story about his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hero of that story. We're all supporting characters in one way or another in that story, and the Lord has done that in four acts. He has given us creation. He has given us fall. 
He's given us redemption. He's given us glorification. So in creation, we learn what is good about the world. In fall, we come to understand what is wrong with the world. In redemption, we see how will the world be fixed. And in glorification, we see how will the world be once everything is fixed. So we take that template into the world that is created by the magical minds of Marvel and their film department. And we ask what's good about the creation, what's good in Guardians of the Galaxy. So Jared, where do you see goodness? in the Guardians of the Galaxy world starting in the in the sequel. I think they get I think they get friendship right. I mean these guardians are loyal to one another self-sacrificially. And not only friendship, but I think you know in a way they kind of get family right in many ways. It's these uh, characters are not just friends. They're basically one another's family because you've got Star-Lord whose mother has passed away and his dad he doesn't know who he is for a long time and he was basically raised by a thief and so you've got him he doesn't have family really and but you you learn in this movie that he as he meets his father that he does but that his father's a sorry excuse for a father too and then um you've got uh, drax um who lost his family you know, none of them have have family members except uh, Nebula and what is the what is the green girl's name? Gamora. Gamora. Yeah, G- Gamora and Nebula are sisters, but their their relationship strained as well. Now there there's reconciliation with that, but I think it gets some of the familial importance right as far as how much we need each other and how there is this back and forth. I mean, think about how much your family gets on your nerves, you know, but yet it's kind of like growing up with sibling sibling. You know, you know, my sister will beat me up, but if somebody else messes with me, you know, or vice versa. And I got beat up a lot by my sister because she was a giant. But but anyway, I, I'm pretty uh, sure she listens to this podcast. And, uh, I'm 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 going to assume that you have a particular sister in mind. I don't know which of your three sisters you have in mind. But what I'm going to say to that sister, whoever she may be, is please go ahead and beat Jared up some more. There's nothing more needful in his life right now than his sister to remind him. Just exactly what the with me. yeah that the dynamics of the relationship haven't changed. Yeah, yeah. I am so Whatever, glad man. to have you on the record as being beaten up by your sister regularly. Hey, I got beat up a lot. She played college basketball. She was there's a picture of her. So she was six foot at like sixth grade, and um, there's a picture of her hugging me. And dude, it looks like a giant hugging a baby. I'm like I may be four feet tall <laughs> or something. It's crazy. It's a it's a crazy picture, but like she's leaned over me, giving me a hug. And no wonder she whipped me for so long. I finally, I never, I never caught up. She's still taller than me and uh, could Bro- probably still whip me, but don't get any ideas. Brother, sister. I'm, I, I'm just going to speak some truth into your life as a brother. The the reason she whipped you was not because she was physically bigger. Uh, it's because you were the, the prototypical fulfillment of the little brother stereotype. <laughs> That's what she says. I'm hey, just speaking truth wanna, in your life. Do you want to talk about the times that I whipped you like back in the day when we used to wrestle a little bit and you want to talk about that at all or so uh so we're moving into pure fiction at this point we're moving into something <laughs> even more incredible than the idea of a, a a raccoon that talks and can rebuild ships now look I, you, <laughs> you have narrowed it down to to one of two sisters with the college basketball reference so hello amy hello miranda thank you for all you did to torment jared in his childhood please continue doing that <laughs> and if our oh, listeners are still with us so i think i'm agreed with you that creation here that there's a lot of good built into the social dynamics of these this motley sure. crew of adventurers and the way they've learned to care for each other and uh, invest in one another, protect one another. I think you and I will also agree that there's threads of that, though, that get into the fallenness of this story. And so uh, the only mm-hmm. note I want to talk about the goodness of this story before we move into the category of fall is that it's a beautiful world. You know, I don't I don't often like to be in space if there aren't Jedis involved. Those really aren't, you know, my wheelhouse when it comes to movies, just like with comic books. I mentioned earlier, but this is a visually lush world that they live in, and it's a creatively uh, beautiful world as well. There's lots of fun ideas and snappy writing and, and witty dialogue that takes place here. And so to whatever degree a pop action movie built on a comic book franchise can do this, 
there's a real high quality of construction going on in the Guardians of the Galaxy here too, and that that's reflective uh, with with no sarcasm on my end. That's reflective of the original goodness of the actual creator who is innovative and wise and powerful and very good in his creativity of being surprising with just how wonderful he can make the world and the cosmos and and a baby and the way food interacts with your palate. And so, and let me uh, <clears throat> let me say that it gets just a couple things. There's one sense where it gets human responsibility right as far as um, you know the, these characters have experienced virtually every negative family environment um, that one can experience. Yet none of them had a stable family environment. Yet we see the guardians take responsibility for their own actions. You know they're they're not mere products of their upbringing. Um, they choose to do good and they choose to oppose evil on on one side of it. But then there's a on the other side of it, which I thought kind of goes against that a little bit, is the scene between Nebula and Gamora, where Nebula basically says, you know, Gamora wanted to win and Nebula just wanted a sister because their their father evidently pit them against each other in this sibling rivalry and Gamora would evidently whip Nebula all the time. Um, I understand that a little bit as far as <laughs> as far as you know, being in the shadow of your your siblings, I'll, I'll never forget. You know, Jeff and I grew up in Sparta, Tennessee, so we're in a small hometown. And my sisters played uh, basketball, and so everybody knew. You know, in 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 Sparta, if you play, if you're on the basketball team, and they were they were uh, number one in the nation uh, when. Uh, my sister Miranda was in high school, and they were number one in the state several times while Amy was on the team. And, um, you know, I can remember when I went to my dad's funeral, I, I can't tell you how many people said, oh, I didn't know uh, Roger had a son. <laughs> there, were, there were so many people that said that to me. That'll but, bless you. That'll bless yeah, you. Yeah, that'll, that'll bless your heart. Yeah, he did. He did. He had a son. It's amazing. It's a miracle. <laughs> there's, there's all these jokes. I've always been here. <laughs> all these jokes filling my head right now. I'm just going <laughs> to... <laughs> not going to do that, but yeah, man, that's got to be kind of uh, disheartening. So what I what I want to come against is Nebula kind of blaming Gamora and right. Right. for how she felt towards her. And the reality is, you have to take response. So if you have a sibling that is better at something, you let's say basketball, you need to as as a Christian, you don't need to be like Nebula in this movie. I think that's a I think see they kind of present her as a victim <clears throat> when I when I think she so I think she needs to take responsibility for her feelings towards her sister. Um, instead of being jealous of her sister, she should have been glad for her, happy for her sister. Just like and, uh, just like you rejoiced at your sister's success in basketball. When, absolutely. When, and I kept getting cut, man. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, I, <laughs> I I tried to play and, and uh, basketball is my favorite sport and I kept getting cut. And so you have to wrestle with that, wrestle with things like that as a young believer. And if you have a sibling who's better at something than you growing up, um, you may there may be a there's there's going to be a temptation for jealousy and the reality is you need to don't be like Nebula and be jealous instead you have to take responsibility for your actions and and so and for your feelings you're responsible for how you feel and you need to rebuke covetous feelings sinful feelings sinful jealousy feelings and and instead be thankful for who God made you to be God didn't make me to be a uh, this this college basketball player or whatever you know. Um, but he did. He did them, and you know I'm thankful for who the Lord made me. And regardless and who, who and who He made them, right? Like it, it's absolutely. a good thing for the giver of gifts to give a diversity of gifts to different people. Oh, absolutely. And Chris Pine. So Chris Pine, I was watching him one night on. A, it was on a late show. I can't remember. They were interviewing him, but they were like the the host was saying, you know, I I heard that you sing some, and so do you care to sing a little bit for us? And so they gave him a mic, dude, and it's like Frank Sinatra or something. I'm like you got to be kidding me. And then on. Moana, all of a sudden we discover that the rock can sing. I'm like, I'm like, you know, God just gives some people like it's like he pours this. Oh, I'm going to make this one like the top, you know, the every woman looks at him and wants him, you know, and then I'm going to make him to where he can sing. And and I, I just it's just uh, it's interesting. But whoever God made you to be, you can be for his glory, whether that's in Hollywood or or if you're digging ditches or whatever. There's dignity in who the Lord made you to be. And you need to embrace it and enjoy him for whoever he made you to be. Absolutely. So I guess I kind of let us get off the rails a little bit there because we've went into a criticism of Nebula. That seems like a good point. To, to say well, what's fallen 
about this world, and as we've just talked about, interpersonal dynamics in this film aren't perfect. They, for green-skinned cyber warrior women and cybernetically engineered raccoons, <laughs> the relationships are, are pretty realistic. I mean, they look mm-hmm. like the way siblings relate to one another. They look like the way coworkers relate to one another. They look like the way people for whom there is some kind of romantic chemistry, but one that hasn't been explored. The relationships that play out in Guardians of the Galaxy look like what you see in the real world, but in doing so, they look like fallen relationships. So we've talked about Nebula. Uh, I think the dynamics of the crew that comprise the Guardians of the Galaxy, for me, one of my disappointments is that they they are heroes who are very much anti-heroes in some ways, like they're lovable oafs. But they're also the sort of people who will rob the 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 customer that they just serviced by destroying some threat that was attacking their kingdom. You know, they'll, they'll they'll collect on that contract after killing the big bad beast. But on their way out the door, they will rob the same people they've just been working for and be chased across the galaxy by them. And we're supposed to kind of elbow each other in the ribs and say, ha ha, those lovable scoundrels. That's that's not the kind of people that we're supposed to find admirable. And this movie kind of tells you, eh, it's okay. As long as they're as long as they're good people at heart, it's okay if they act like villains. I, I don't care for that as much. It's a good point. I also think that as far as what's distorted and evil is I think the the idol in this in this movie is family or uh you know all that man has is one another um all you have are those who are close to you and so man's ultimate end is one another and I, I think that's the idol in this movie you want to do you want to give any pushback on that no I, I think that's a provocative idea so this is sort of a humanistic movie that mm. that all we have is each other and all that is shaping our world is what we make out of it by linking arms together you that that's consistent with what you're saying Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that that's getting back to the the tendrils of goodness and fallenness that look like the real world in this movie. Family is a good thing. Jared's not saying anything critical of seeing family as of great importance. He's saying that when something that's of great importance is elevated to ultimate importance, it becomes a bad thing. So there's a lot of good lessons here about learning to live with the person who is completely different from you and living with them in such a way that affection grows between you through acts of self-sacrifice. That That's good there. But when that's the highest good, well, now all of a sudden we've tried to cram the, the creator who is himself the highest good out of the picture. And then it becomes deeply fallen and destructive. So both of those things are playing out in this movie. Right, right. And it, it's good for you, though. God, you know, God not making your family your ultimate end, that is a, a good thing because your family your family will let you down. Your family, uh, my my dad went to be with the Lord almost four years ago, you know, and if he was my ultimate end, I'd be in trouble. Right. God is providing, I mean, you could you could argue, you know, the Bible uses familial language to speak of God, right? And um, God reveals himself in a familial way to us as as father. And so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's wonderful, a wonderful reality that, and somebody told me this when dad went to be with the Lord, that whatever you lost in your father, you can, um, you know, be provided by God. God will meet that need above and beyond because, because God, everything I loved about my dad, um, it's because God made him that way, right? All the positive, all the good, um, everything that you, you know, listener, everything you love about your, your spouse, your, I mean, your children, your, your parents, your uncles, your friends, those things that draw you in, you know, you can know the God who made them and made everything you love about them. You know, I mean, it, it's so you're not losing anything. You know, we gain, you know, as a pastor, Jeff, and you can probably resonate with this. One of the main questions I get asked is, about heaven is, is knowing family. You know, will I know my loved ones? Because people have this concept of, you know, if they don't know their family, then they're going to, it's not going to be heaven type thing. Yeah, I get that question all the time. And I'm so glad you raised that issue. So go ahead and and kind of walk people through how they should think through the idea of loved ones either being in eternity with them or if they're outside of Christ to uh, to, to conceive of, a, of an eternity without their loved one. Yeah, in, in 2 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul actually um, talks about how he, he longs to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, but he doesn't want to be kind of unzipped from his body. Um, But the way that he describes going to be with the Lord, he calls it 
basically it's it's like he, he refers to it as being swallowed up in in life um and so there's this there's this unity that takes place in in heaven with your brothers and sisters as you are the bride of Christ and so you lose nothing and gain everything so in in my opinion it's like your most important relationship on earth imagine having that relationship with an innumerable amount of people that that closeness and not only that but having that relationship with Jesus Christ as far as closeness as far as so in other words when we go to heaven we lose nothing and gain everything that's yeah, so there, there's a heart level issue here and there's a theological level issue it, it's inconceivable for me in my humanity to enter mm-hmm. into heaven without some of the people who are most dear to me, right? So sure. if I think right now about one of my children or my wife or my parents or someone like you who I've walked with through the days of my life here, I mm-hmm. cannot conceive of how that wouldn't lessen my enjoyment of heaven. So that's the heart level issue that I want to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, though, we serve a God of infinitely surpassing worth and glory. Mm -hmm. And because he is that, he is infinitely satisfying and he is infinitely delightful. And so I want to own what my heart says, but I also want to own what the Bible says, that it will be it will be exceedingly more than enough to be in Mm -hmm. the presence of Jesus Christ. And it will be a a sweet bonus to have the fellowship of the saints. I'm mindful of Revelation saying that he will wipe away every tear. You don't Mm -hmm. want to be too literal with apocalyptic imagery, but I can see a world where the surpassing worth of Christ wipes away the tears that come from my awareness that someone I cared about has reaped the fruit of their persistent rebellion against the good creator that uh, that made them in his image and against whom they've spent their days walking in rebellion. And I think Christ will do it and he will be enough and he will be infinitely satisfying. And so my heart, I want to own it as a human, but I also want to live in faith that the infinite worth of Christ should not be minimized in our sight and that it will make mm-hmm. eternity uh, with him in his presence. That will be heaven because it is him. Lewis, Amen. to the point you made, C.S. Lewis says, the one who has God and nothing else has no less than the one who has God and everything else. And mm-hmm. that's rooted in the infinite worth of our God. And so that's going to define the glory of heaven and the enjoyment of heaven. Amen, buddy. Amen. And it's wonderful to think about and to contemplate heaven and the new heavens and and the new earth and um, the concept of being one with uh, with our Lord and one with one another, but yet there's still a distinction. I mean, there's still individuality, but there's also this this unity that is something that we've only get pictures of in the local church here. Um, you know, you think of your most important um, brother, or sister in Christ, who the closest person you're to, and imagine having that with people you haven't met yet, um, people from every tribe and tongue, and and not to mention that you know when Paul. Paul's talking about being unzipped from his body and going to be with the Lord. He, he refers to it as being swallowed up in life. And so even though he doesn't have a body absent from the body present with the Lord, there is still he, – he, he seems to be indicating that it is better to be swallowed up in life than it is to have a body here on earth. And so even though like my daddy who's with Christ right now does not have a body because his body's still on the ground, um, his soul is with the Lord and he is swallowed up in life. He doesn't need his body. He has something somehow, whatever he lacks from a body, Christ provides abundantly. Daddy is swallowed up in life. I mean, it's hard for me to be angry about that. I miss him, man. But, uh, you know, it's hard to get angry about that. Yeah. Amen. So, yeah, we're we're kind of going down some rabbit trails. Um, what about redemption here? So I'm just going to pause it as a starting point that redemption here looks like banding together with your closest friends and forging a brave new world together, no matter what the what opposition comes up against you. That that seems to be the mechanism, this, this fraternal bond whereby redemption is going to come into the Guardians of the Galaxies world. What would you say beyond mm-hmm. that? Um, I think you're right. I think that that is the mode of redemption in this world um, in Guardians of, of the Galaxy 2. Um, I'd like to talk a minute about um, how ego is a poor substitute for Yahweh. Um, Absolutely. Ego is a, is a little G-God, but he has power to create, which is something that only – only big G God, you know, can do. And ego, it's interesting. He it seems that he got lonely, so he created a planet from himself. And then, because he wanted to learn what it was like to be human.
human, he became human. Now, compare that to the God of the Bible, or the, the only God who exists. Yahweh is creator. Our God is in need of nothing. Our God is Trinity, so he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three persons are one God from eternity past. They have no beginning. God has no beginning. Thus, the three persons love one another and are in relationship, perfect relationship, perfect closeness. And have been from eternity past, yeah. Right, have been from eternity past. And and actually, that's that's a good argument for the Trinity because, you know, there's several other religions that claim that God is love. But if you have no object to love, how can you be love? And so in the Trinity, you have three uh, distinct persons who who pour out their love on one another. So all three persons have an object to love. They are one another's beloved from eternity past. And so it it is a, a good good uh, proof for the Trinity, and Christianity is the only uh, religion that does have uh, the triune God emphasis. You know, our God, so our God created because he freely chose to create. He was not lonely. He created for his own glory. And furthermore, Yahweh is all-knowing. You know, this means that he knows all things that can be known and all forms of knowledge that are possible. So Yahweh doesn't need to become human in order to learn something about being human. Human. Yahweh knows all that can be known. I, I believe I would stretch that even to how a plant feels. You know, I would stretch stretch it to um, even how an animal thinks. Um, you know, if Yahweh doesn't know it, he wouldn't be able to create it. And so he creates all things because he know he's able to create everything that in the known universe. And even how these things feel and even how these things think, because he knows all the knowledge that can possibly be known. So he's not like ego in that way. Ego is not all knowing or he wouldn't have he wouldn't have found Chris Pratt because it would have been his undoing. Right. Yeah. And then not only that, but ego's plan, you know, doing his, his plan due to being bored with his immortality. So he's he's basically bored with his godness and with the inferior life that he's created. So he's unhappy with his creation. And it's interesting because you look at the Bible and God is enjoying his creation before sin, right? But ego decides to remake everything, all planets, and he's going to remake it as extensions of himself. And so it, there's this, there's these seedlings and he needs another God to kind of help him activate this extension of himself in these planets. And and so there's this sinister, you know, he's potentially going to kill millions of his creation for no other reason than, you know, he doesn't arbitrarily, you know, he, he doesn't like them. Um, but Yahweh is not evil or sinful like ego. Yahweh created all things for his glory, not to not due to being lonely. And he's also other than his creation and always remains other than his creation. And the question is, is how can God become bored with himself? That's not a God. Ego, ego actually sounds more like Satan, um, like, like an angel who's jealous of man than the God of the Bible. And so returning back to um, how does the gospel apply, you know, the gospel applies. So if the idol is all we have is one another, returning back to that, and all we have is family or we have friends, this familial relationship, stick together relationship with others, the gospel applies because God unites us to himself in Christ. What, what's amazing is, is that the Holy Spirit unites Christians to Christ. Like there is union with Christ. The Bible use, uses uh, adoption language, and you'll notice how many of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote and um, several other uh, writers in the New Testament use language like in Christ, referring to the churches in Christ or the Christians. And I mean, it's just it's just very interesting when you start picking that up in the greetings that are there. You know, we are united to Jesus Christ by the Spirit, and it's important because not only do we have family, family in God, we also have an innumerable family in our brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. We literally lose nothing and uh, and gain everything. And so, so in other words, our ultimate end is God. And God made man um, in need of relationship. And what we have in heaven is not only perfect relationship with God, we have perfect relationship with God the Son incarnate by the Spirit. And through that, we have perfect relationship with one another. And so all this... 
all this utopia that everybody talks about, heaven is going to be like that. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to interject there. You said God made man to to need relationship, right? Right. That That's not said in a way that man could be otherwise. Like God could have just made us self-sustaining, self-fulfilling creatures by mm-hmm. nature of not being God, who is self-sustaining and self-existent. By the very nature of being created beings, we are necessarily contingent beings. We're dependent mm-hmm. upon something outside of ourselves for our existence, for a continued existence, for fulfillment. And so it's not that God just in some, not to make a bad pun here, I've got some more I want to say on this later, but uh, in some kind of ego trip made a bunch of fawning syncophants to, to mm-hmm. flutter around him. It's that by creating uh, as a category, we are contingent upon the one who is not contingent upon anything other than himself. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it's inherent to creatureliness is what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Oh, anyway. oh yeah. And, it, and he made us in need of one another as well. If you, I mean, listener, if you go back and read Genesis, you'll notice some of the first things. Once they get out of the garden, you'll notice that cities spring up and communities spring up and people spring up. And, you know, it, it's just it's it's really quick. I mean, it's just it's very it's very interesting um, how how man is made to need man. So we're we're walking through those categories still. So we've covered creation and fall and redemption. Uh, we've come to glorification, and this movie kind of ends on glorification. the 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 better world that this movie conceives of is sort of right in line with its idea of redemption. It's that it, it's basically the hashtag squad goals that me and my crew are going to go out and create a better future defined by whatever we want it to look like, but it will be essentially our creation together. We'll make this world into whatever we want. And so it becomes very open-ended. There's no real telos or aim or object towards which history is going to move. It's just going to be whatever we prefer in the moment. And that's a very, that's a very weak vision of heaven and a new earth, uh, much, much reduced in comparison to God's plan to remake creation. So uh, that, that's my read on what the better world it conceives of looks like, what, what would you say to modify that? No, I think you're right, man. Um, I, that's a, I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. Uh, you, you know, kind of like history is what we make it and whatever we want it to be. Um, you end up with this, you end up with kind of an arbitrary uh, morality and an arbitrary, nothing that kind of stands in stone, but something that is always changing, um, which is which is scary if you think about morality is constantly changing based on whoever's either in power or whoever is, or or even what our supreme end is. If man's supreme end continually changes, I mean, I, I don't think that that's a, a good thing or a positive thing. Um, it just means the person with the biggest stick gets to determine what man's ultimate end is. And I don't want anybody determining that. I want I want a God who is all good determining that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that we're talking, you know, this is a humanistic movie. Mm-hmm. It, it sees humanity as the highest. And I say humanity. I mean, blue-skinned, also tree people. Demigod. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's the human level, the creaturely level is the highest, you know, good in, in the highest um, form of existence that, that there is. And that's how humanism undercuts itself by saying humanity is all that is. It necessarily also says there's nothing transcendent. And if I can't find anything transcendent, I can't have any real sense of meaning. I can only say this was enjoyable for me for a time, maybe a prolonged time, but it was just enjoyable. And you get into really pragmatic stuff that starts justifying really atrocious uh, evils done against neighbor uh, because the highest good we can conceive of is whatever brings the most good to the most people or, you know, brings me the deepest satisfaction in the moment, all of which are just unsustainable as visions of life. Good point, man. Good point. All right. So we've kind of... We've taken some rabbit trails, obviously, but we've we've chopped up the the big category stuff of Guardians of the Galaxy. We've in in doing so now moving into the questions that to turn out would recommend we ask. Having done the analysis of creation, fall, redemption, glorification, we've answered his first question: What's the story? And then getting into his second question: Where I am seeing the style and shape of this imaginary world? We've also done a lot of lifting there. So we're talking about a world that gets camaraderie right, a world that gets the important of family right in certain ways. It's a visually rich and creatively lush world that they're in, uh, but it's also deeply riddled with major holes. So 
the family has gone from a good thing to a false god. It's been elevated to a place that it should not appropriately be placed here. Um, this is a humanistic world. And so as we just talked about, um, transcendence is not there. And to just continue thinking through that theme with a humanistic vision of life, you actually can't also have true community. A community has to have a center upon which uh, everyone orbits. The church has that richly. Jesus Christ is the center that holds everything together. But if you're saying that the changing whims of fickle human nature are uh, are going to be the, the foundation stones upon which we build our society, you're going to watch that society maybe rise up maybe even quickly, but it's going to tumble just as quickly and collapse as quickly because humans as fallen creatures are going to fall apart. They're going to, to they're going to be wicked and selfish and hostile and all the things that we can observe empirically throughout human history. And that is not a center that is stable enough around which human society can be built. So really the the self defeat of the guardians of the galaxy is going to be the guardians of the galaxy. You know, I, I guess I gave that away with the term self defeat. Whatever brave new world they're moving forward into, relying on each other, they're necessarily going to fail if if this story looks like real life, because at some point someone's going to be selfish and their self-interest is going to run into the other person's self-interest and they have nothing outside of themselves by which to say this person is more right and I am less right and therefore we should do the thing that is more right or to say we're both wrong and we need something to criticize us and give us a way forward into something better. They need that transcendent thing and they won't have it. And so I just want to point again back to the church. The church gets all kinds of stuff wrong in every age. But because we believe in a transcendent God who exists outside of us and to whom we owe all allegiance, we have this wonderful mechanism of repentance and self-criticism. Uh, Oz Guinness in his book Renaissance points out that Christianity's strength, practically speaking, is found in the renewal of revival movements where we can come in and say, we have erred and we have strayed. And in response to the convicting word of God, we're going to move back towards health. And that this mechanism of self-reflection and self-criticism that is built in light of the God who exists outside of us and speaks authoritatively to us, it actually ends up being the thing that we can glom onto and survive the changing dynamics of life in a fallen world as we build our lives on that transcendent truth. So the guardians look good flying off into the into the cosmos, ready to face the next challenge. But if this story is going to actually tell a story in volume three that looks like human history, they're going to they're going to fall apart because they can't uh, depend upon themselves for ultimate meaning and ultimate community coming out of it. Spoiler alert for part three there. Yeah. So what's good, true and awesome here? Uh, we're going to behold common grace. There's some of the stuff that it gets right implicitly. So one thing that this movie is about as a sub theme, you know, we said this is a movie about family. That's absolutely what this movie is about. What's family? How do I know my family? Uh, how do I live with my family? That Those are the big questions here. But this movie also gets right that fatherhood's important and that fatherhood shapes our identity. So Peter Quill is casting about for a vision of his father because he doesn't really understand himself until he understands who his father is. And he, he meets his genetic father or whatever whatever you call it, when a celestial procreates with a human being, he finds the, 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 the being that he is physically dependent upon, and he finds that that being is loathsome. But then he finds that the pirate who he thought was his kidnapper, but who had, in ways that weren't always crystal clear to Peter, nonetheless taken care of him throughout his most vulnerable years, that he actually had a father there. It, it, it shifts Peter's sense of himself, and he becomes much more confident, and he becomes much more stable and he's actually willing to oppose the genetic father using the resources of what he has in his relational father. Gamora and Nebula, and the same deal, they are the products of wicked fathers, and it shaped their identity, and they're still dealing with the consequences of a wicked father and the way it impacted their identity. And so 
this isn't the sort of thing that you want to hold up and say, isn't this lovely? But nonetheless, it's getting at the 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 very real truth that fathers matter and that fathers are going to shape your identity. And that may be a message that we need to hear in a, in a day that, that thinks itself to be basically self-determining. You know, I can be whoever I want in any given moment, in any given moment. I can change my gender at any change in my whims about who I sense myself to be. I can even change my my nature. You know, there's people who say that they're animal kin and that although they appear human, they're actually a, a tiger by nature. This movie, I don't think it knows what it's doing, but it tells you, yeah, there are factors outside of you that determine who you are, and that's inescapable. It, it may play out in a way that's hurtful and that you have to struggle to overcome, or it may play out in a way that you're unexpectedly pleased by, but nonetheless, who you are is not entirely a self-created uh, project. Does that make sense, Jared? It does. It does, brother. Uh, Keep Rocket, rolling. Well, Rocket Raccoon is, is sort of there, too. You know, he can't stand the thought of being reduced to his mere biological identity because he's he's been cybernetically enhanced, right? So he's more than just his biological identity. But the fact that he basically came out of a Petri dish leaves him unable to connect with people. He can't trust people. He's, he's so hostile in this movie towards the Guardians of the Galaxy because mm-hmm. he's not rooted in any identity. Uh, outside of himself and so he doesn't he doesn't you know he's not willing to believe that he can love these people and they'll love him back and that they will basically be with him and him with them going forward into the future i think he comes around on that but in in some ways he's still struggling with a daddy issue even as a cybernetically and genetically enhanced raccoon he he needs someone to say authoritatively this is who you are right mm-hmm. right so uh, i think that's going on there that that that's good and true the the bad side here so question four, what's distorted, evil, and false? How can I subvert idolatry? You've just been talking about ego, and ego is one of a, a number of cosmic, cosmically powerful beings in the Marvel Universe, but they they did something very specific in choosing ego for this role, and, and I'm going to just confess, I don't know if this is rooted in a comic narrative tradition. So this story may have played out in previous comic books that they adapted into a movie. We've seen lots of that stuff. You know, um, for instance, Nolan drew heavily on Batman Year One, which is a famous Batman story when he put together his trilogy of Batman movies. But I think they're doing something very specific with Ego here, regardless of what happened in the comics, because Ego is a creator, right? That sounds like the true God. Right. Ego is a creator God who has an interest in the human race and other creatures. That sounds like the true God. But even his name, Ego, he is a fundamental self-centered being in a way Mm -hmm. that is wicked. And if you don't understand the doctrine of God's glory, you may think that God, the the living God, the true God, is just ego, that he has created all things to orbit around himself as a applause society to, to feed his, again, no pun intended, ego. So we want to be crystal clear here, as Jared's already talked about, I think they have chosen a false God very carefully. Carefully. Mm-hmm. So when you're able to come away from ego in Guardians of the Galaxy, rightly recognizing him to be a monster to be opposed, right? I mean, he, he shows himself to, to be that by putting a cancerous tumor in Quill's mom's brain for purely selfish reasons. He he shows himself to be that by wanting to remake the galaxy, which again, sounds like the one true God, but he wants to remake the galaxy in a way that does not respect the unique features of the creation he's replacing, right? So our God is a redeemer. Uh, ego is just a destroyer. They're, they're doing that in a way where I think you come away going, that, that ego is a monster and it's supposed to play in your own heart by saying all gods are monstrous. All gods are are ego driven all gods are uh, the the sort of creatures to be rejected because they're not you know they're not orbiting around my own self interest and my own self worth so i want to be really clear here god is the being who is worthy of highest honor uh, in existence and therefore for him to create out as jared said of the overflow of the eternal loving relationship that is within the trinity is not an exercise in selfish 
selfish ego for him to do that. It is an exercise in gracious love to others that he would give them existence and he would give them the the privileges of common grace. And it would be deeply inappropriate. It would be unjust at a cosmic level for the one who is worthy of all glory to give his glory to another. It is cosmically just and appropriate for contingent beings like us to give glory to the one who's worthy of all glory. Man, and so man, we, that's and that's a great point, man, because it's that's something for us. It's hard for folks to wrap their minds around. But if God, if God gives us the glory, He ceases to be God, right? Yes, and 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 straight up, the cosmos is turned on its head because the most inappropriate thing is for something that's not God to have God's glory. I mean, you, you know, I want to go to the Ghostbusters, where like cats and dogs falling from the skies, and you know, chaos reigning. Like, I think the molecules of the cosmos would come apart if there was some attempt to strip God of His glory in some hypothetical mechanism. Mechanism. It, it, it's the most inappropriate thing in the world for anything to get the glory that God deserves, not to, to see ego get the comeuppance he deserves for his wicked selfishness. Those are just they're, they're categorically uh, different things. The apples and oranges doesn't even begin to describe the contrast between the two. And we want to stick we want to stick to that, particularly if you're talking to your kids about this movie. I don't know what age you're going to say, I'll let my kids watch Guardians of the Galaxy. But at whatever point you're doing that, if you're doing it, you want to walk them very clearly through an ego who is um, a wicked, wickedly selfish being and the God who is centered on his own glory in the most beautifully appropriate way possible. So, Jared, last question then. Uh, unless, is there anything you want to add to that? I kind of went on a monologue there. No, I think you hit every point that need to be hit, man. Great okay. points. So, how does the gospel apply here? Well, I think that I think the thing you want to do is what we just talked about. Show the difference between uh, ego, who does what he does for wicked self-interest, and a God who creates. Uh, excuse me, the contrast between ego and the the one true God who creates out of the overflowing abundance of the love that is present eternally within the Trinity Mm -hmm. and does it in a way that invites uh, the people that he creates into the goodness of that eternal relationship within the Trinity. Mm -hmm. I also think you want to point to Redeemer. I think you want to highlight that these people, the Guardians of the Galaxy, no matter how much they love each other, no matter how much they're going to give themselves for each other, no matter how much it would seem like the coolest thing in the world to hang out with these guys on their spaceship when they fly around doing cool stuff. They don't have the resources within their group for all the powers they have. They don't have the resources within their group to save themselves. They can't even build a life to, uh, with the resources they have. So they need, just like we do, they need a redeemer. They need someone to come in who is infinitely worthy, infinitely capable, and to be everything that they can't find within themselves. So I think the gospel here is these are great people, powerful characters, seem like very lovable, but they're inadequate, just the way that you and I are inadequate. And and they, in their inadequacy, say, we need someone to save us in the same way that you and I, as actual human beings who do exist in God's world, by our inadequacy, say, we need a Savior. We can't fix this on our own. We need someone to fix it for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that as far as uh, as far as the, the good news is concerned. We, you know, this this, this movie so much emphasizes that familial relationship among the this these guardians of the galaxy that that um, that's all they've got and thus that that is their salvation but yet you see how much turmoil there really is still in that and and so the the relationship that they have at the end is the best that it can possibly be right yeah it, it is and the the narrative though gives you all kinds of hints about Basically, the inadequacy even of their own group. Now, there's some really lovingly uh, sacrificial stuff that takes place. I think about when Ego is basically destroying the world. There's a scene where Drax is carrying another member of the crew, and the ground is rising up to swallow him. And right before it covers his mouth, he lifts her above his head in in hopes of getting her out above the ground, swallowing him up. Mm -hmm. So that's really beautiful. That's self-sacrificial. It's really gorgeous. But not too long before that, we saw Drax looking into a sunset as, you know, I talked about earlier that kind of the daddy issues that are present in this movie. Mm -hmm. He's a dad interrupted. Nothing is going to be able to fill the hole that the, the death of his family 
has left within yeah. him. And so e- even this guy who's grown a ton as a character in the right direction, y- you can just look at his character arc and say, there's a there's a furnace within him that if something infinitely worthy doesn't come along to fill it, he's in major trouble. And so, th- yeah, just to come back full circle to where I was talking about just a minute ago, they need a savior to come in and be their infinitely valuable uh, resource, basically. I mean, all right, man, anything else you want to say about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? That's it, man. Ready to put a bow on it, man. Okay. The only thing I'm going to say in addition is that I just did not like the soundtrack to this one as much as I like the soundtrack to uh, Volume 1. So when we get Infinity War, I'm assuming we may get uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 on the far side of that. Let, let's get back on that and start uh, scouring the Spotify list so that we can find another another excellent soundtrack. Come on, Marvel. We don't ask much from you. Uh, mm-hmm. Get this to us. Yes, sir. Jerry, where can they find you online? You can find me online at jaredmore.exaltchrist.com. You can find me on Twitter at Jared H. Moore. I also have another podcast called All Truth is God's Truth. Check it out. And you can find me at Facebook at All Truth is God's Truth. Guys, I'm at Right Jeff on most social media platforms. Love to connect with you there. Uh, our podcast and the blog that's now on Patheos, you can find us on most social media platforms as well. And almost everywhere we're at, in fact, I can't think of anywhere that's that's an exception to this rule, we're, our username is going to be PCCD Pod. So if you're on Twitter, PCCD Pod. Same for Facebook. Same for the subreddit. Same for our Instagram account, which we would love to connect with you on Instagram. And Jared, how do they find us on Pinterest? It is PCCD Pod. Okay, so we tried to we tried to make us <laughs> we try to make ourselves easy to find. If you can remember PCCD Pod, you're going to find us. Our podcasts are available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Acast, Player FM, everywhere you want to find us, uh, except for Spotify, which we're hoping to be on Spotify very soon. You can find us there, and we would so appreciate if whichever platform you use to listen to our podcasts, if you'd be willing to go give us a review, we 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 covet in. The, you know the healthiest sense of that word, the five star reviews. But we'll take whatever you want to give us, and we will uh, we'll read those and we'll respond if you request. We want to know what you think. We want to know how we can serve you better. Uh, we want to continue the conversation. So please. Connect with us on those various social media sites and also through those reviews, the reviews being particularly helpful to helping new people find the show. All right, Jared, what are we going to watch next time? Do you know? Um, uh, Maybe The Last Jedi. Okay. Okay. Well, boy, howdy. Do I have a soapbox to climb up on on that? Oh, we're going to spar over that, man. All right. Well, guys, we're, we're kicking around The Last Jedi. If that sounds good to you, let us know. And uh, we'll be back to you very soon with another episode of the Pop Culture Quorum Dale podcast. tuning in to this episode of the Pop Culture Quorum Deo podcast. I'm your host, Jeff, along with my other host, or I guess I should say, along with my co-host, Jared Moore, who's laughing at me. Darn it, Jared. Your other host. What, what's the right word? Because, I mean, you're not like the secondary host. I'm Just not co-host. like your, your other host. Every, I mean, you're a every, parasite host. Everybody but <laughs> you would be the other host. Like, you know, you don't have to say the other host. All right. You're not talking to yourself. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to try that again. 18, we're at 19 oh, this minutes. This has to stay in there. Yeah, it does.